This is the second Fundamentals of Misting video where we examine the main components in a misting system and really dig into how they work. In this one, we're going to talk about the nozzles. Mistaway's nozzles are known as slimline nozzles, and they look like this. There are three parts to each nozzle. A nozzle tip that threads into an adapter that has one end machined to fit into a push-to-connect fitting. All the interesting stuff happens inside the nozzle body. So let's examine a cutaway diagram to see what's going on in there. In this diagram, the fluid is flowing from left to right. So let's identify the components the same way. First, there is a small ball attached to a spring that acts as a check valve. Just downstream of that is a polypropylene filter that screens particles in the fluid before they can clog the orifice. Downstream of the filter is what we call a vortex pin. There are two grooves machined into the vortex pin that impart a cone shape to the mist. Finally, there is the nozzle tip, which in our nozzles contains a hole or orifice that is 12 thousandths of an inch in diameter. Now let's look at the nozzle in action. Before the pump turns on, the ball is sealed against the nozzle inlet. When the pump runs, the force of the fluid increases and opens the nozzle, pushing the ball toward the tip and compressing the spring. The fluid flows through the filter around the vortex pin and then is atomized into very small droplets as it is pushed through the orifice. After the pump shuts off, the spring force is able to overcome the force of the fluid and it pushes the ball back upstream where it seals. One important characteristic of any nozzle is the droplet size it produces. Remember from the intro video, the droplet size controls how much surface area is generated during a mist cycle and is an important factor in the size of the overall blanket of protection. The smaller the droplet, the greater the relative surface area. The droplet size also controls the time it takes the droplets to fall to the ground, as well as their susceptibility to being blown off target by the wind. The smaller the droplet, the longer it takes to fall, and the higher the potential for off-property drift. Take a look at this chart. For example, a 5 micron droplet takes almost 2,000 seconds to fall 5 feet. That's about half an hour, and droplets this small are obviously very susceptible to drift. The droplets produced by Mistaway's nozzles have an average diameter of about 40 microns, which you can see from the table takes about 30 seconds to fall to the ground. For mosquito misting, there is a trade-off. We need a droplet size that offers as much surface area as possible while falling to the ground in a reasonable time. 40 micron droplets seem to manage the trade-off well. The systems generate a surface area that is both effective at controlling insects and is insecticide efficient. And the droplets are large enough to fall to the ground in a reasonable time. Another important characteristic of a nozzle is how the flow through the nozzle changes as the pressure behind the fluid changes. As you might expect, the higher the pressure, the higher the flow. Take a look at these photos. In the one on the left, the pressure has been set to 100 PSI. On the right, the pressure is set to 200 PSI. Note the dramatic difference in flow rate and density between the two. At 41 milliliters per minute, the flow out of the nozzle set to 200 PSI is more than twice that of the nozzle operating at 100 PSI, which is only 18 milliliters per minute. To quantify this, we set the pressure at the nozzles using a very accurate digital pressure gauge, like this, and then took a graduated cylinder, like you probably used in high school chemistry class, like this, and captured the mist for 60 seconds, then recorded the volume. We measured the flow this way across a wide range of pressures. This graph shows what we found about the relationship between pressure and flow from Mr. Way's nozzles. For each test, the pressure coordinate is plotted on the x-axis, and the volume coordinate, the flow, is plotted on the y-axis. We also plotted the line that best fits all the data points. This allows us to predict the flow through a nozzle if we know the pressure. Look at the top of the range. Near the 275 PSI operating limit of our pump, a nozzle produces something more than 50 milliliters per minute. Look at how the curve is beginning to flatten at these pressures. Even if the pump generated more pressure, 
the nozzle wouldn't produce that much more flow. Now find 200 PSI on the curve. At pressures below that, the curve steepens, which means that as the pressure falls, the flow drops quickly. Look at the bottom of the range. At 100 PSI, the nozzle produces only 18 milliliters per minute. And if you go below that, to about 80 PSI, the force of the spring in the nozzle will overcome the fluid force and the nozzle will close. So what does all that mean for installing a misting system? Remember, the goal of the system is to maximize the size of the blanket of protection it produces during each mist. But that maximum is subject to the constraints of the components, the pump, the nozzles, and as we'll learn, the tubing. If we know the pump will fail in sustained operation above 275 PSI, we need to provide for some cushion or margin of error. Which is why rule number one is, adjust the pump bypass to produce 250 PSI at the unit, never higher. Given that, in order to maximize the flow through the nozzles and the size of the blanket, each nozzle should operate as close to 250 PSI as possible. But given how quickly the flow decreases as the pressure drops, we need to set a minimum acceptable target pressure of about 200 PSI. We call this pressure flow range the target misting zone. And it's important enough to establish as rule number two. Each nozzle should operate in the target misting zone between 200 and 250 PSI and mist 40 to 50 milliliters per minute.